today, we're going to kick off presence by looking at Matthew's gospel in this 18th chapter, verses 18 to 20. And since this is the gospel, I invite you to stand as you are able in reverence and respect for the reading and the hearing of it. Matthew 18, 18 to 20. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated, and I invite you to join me in prayer. Holy and loving God, who has brought us here by the power of your Spirit, may we come with open hearts and open minds to the power of your Word. May we truly remember vows we have made and live them out faithfully. And where we have failed, we pray for your forgiveness and trust for a chance to start again. May the words of my mouth, the thoughts and meditations of each of our hearts be found pleasing and acceptable in your sight, Lord, our rock and our redeemer, even Jesus our Christ. Amen. Bob Goff, who is the author of the book Love Does, concludes the book by placing his cell phone number on the very last page of the book so that anybody who'd like can call him. He shared the following with others regarding this crazy addition to his text. You might know that I put my personal cell phone number in the back of a couple books that I wrote. And when I told my publisher this, that that's what I wanted to do, she said to me, Are you freaking crazy? I thought for a moment and said, Actually, yes and no. I've noticed that people who have the most impact in my life were the ones who were most available. The ones who showed up. Granted, I do get a lot of calls. And guess what? I answer every call, every single one, unless I'm on a plane or out of cell range. It's terrific. I can't get a thing done. Here's the point. It's hard to be like Jesus... If you don't want to be available to other people. It's what he did. It's what he did every day. If you don't want to be with people. You're going to not enjoy heaven very much. The most available. The most present. The most like Jesus. I like that. Is it crazy? (laughs) You're for sure it's crazy. But it's also not so crazy because that is exactly what Jesus Christ wants us, all of us, to do. To be available, to be present, to show up. We who are United Methodists put it as the second vow of our membership. Will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church with your prayers and your presence? In other words, are you going to show up? All right, anybody out there who is an educator or a scientist will understand what critical mass is, correct? According to Physics Magazine, it is the amount of a given fissionable material necessary to sustain a chain reaction at a constant rate. The critical mass for a bomb based on uranium fission is different than that for plutonium fission, right? If you say so. But let me put it into terms we might understand. Those of us who are a little slower and didn't take physics. Critical mass is an amount necessary or sufficient to have a significant effect or to achieve a result. A critical mass, if you will, of popular support. Let me put it this way. Before AIDS and of recent time, COVID became the one of the major leading causes and fears resulting in death, there was a thing called polio. Polio swarmed upon the nations, killing hundreds of thousands, or if you were lucky, it only maimed you for the rest of your life. 
Its primary target were children who were not strong enough to have the defense to fight it. It took more people, especially in the summer months, because of the heat, according to articles in medical magazines. Mothers and fathers feared for their children, and so they did their very best to quarantine them in the house all summer long to protect them. Have you ever tried to tie down a child during the summer who's been tied down every day in school? It doesn't work very well. All that pent-up summer energy. There was a cry for healing, for a vaccine. It was loud and supported by millions of people around the world. Yet the medical powers that be were very slow to approve a drug that might help. So untested and unsure, Dr. Jonas Salk developed and offered a vaccine that was not certain. But the power of critical mass began to force this vaccine. It began to plead for this. And so he tried it on a patient. Guess what? The patient not only lived, but they developed immunity from polio. And today, you and I do not have to get those ugly polio scars on our arms. And our children and their children will have no clue what you're talking about when you say polio. They'll think you're talking about a swim game in the pool. Marco Polo. Critical mass made the difference. Now, isn't it amazing? It took millions of voices demanding a solution in our present world. But Jesus says... When two or three are gathered together in my name, there I will be with them. You heard it. You heard it from the very mouth of the Lord. That's the only critical mass needed to change the world. You, me, and one other. Now, when I say you, I mean you. Use. It's interesting that the writer of Matthew doesn't say that when we agree on a theological idea or when we should come to common ground on a social principle or even the articles of religion, Jesus will go into action and Jesus will hear and Jesus will respond. Or how about when we all finally agree on a presidential candidate or the issue of human sexuality, does Jesus go into action and get that person elected or does he change that ideal? Is Jesus about splitting up the church to cast out those we don't like who don't agree? No. But when we agree in prayer, in the prayer of one or two, Jesus steps into action. That's probably why our membership vows start with giving of your prayers. When we agree His will be done, His kingdom come in and through us, He gets geared up and comes dancing a jig that even dancing on the stars would rate a 10. He would agree that when we come together and agree on receiving all we need, not what we want... In our hearts and in our minds, He will be there to provide our every need gladly. When we agree that we are sinners and need forgiveness and yearn to forgive others, others whose sins have already been committed against us and sins that will be committed against us, we find a clean heart and a loving heart because Jesus has stepped into action. When we agree we all want to stay away from evil and whatever form it might present itself, we then, no matter how good it looks, Jesus will stand in the way of the evil one and protect us. When we agree that it is His kingdom and His power and the glory and not ours, Jesus will begin to make disciples for the transformation of the world. We need only one or two or three. But beloved, it is so doggone hard to get two or three Christians to agree on anything. And it's even worse if you're a United Methodist Christian. And we wonder, why isn't Jesus here in our midst doing something? Anything. Why isn't he doing what we agree upon? Well, Jesus is here. He is in our midst, waiting for our agreement 
to be on His perfect will. Jesus is in the midst of us when we come together as His forgiven and redeemed people, knowing that even in our differences, we come under His love, under His mercy, and under His grace. When we agree that it is what unites us and forget about what divides us, Jesus is here. I'll say the quote from John Wesley again and again and again, my friends. In the essentials, unity. And in non-essentials, love. We're not alone on this journey of spiritual formation. And not to be political by any means, but to quote a well-worn cliche, it does take a village. It takes a village to help a child of God find their way with two or three or maybe 2,000 or 3,000. It doesn't matter. It takes all who will show up. When we are present and together, people grow spiritually and emotionally into the child that God is desiring them to be. It will take more concentration. It will take more heart of us. It will take more less of us and more of Jesus. But when we are present in our understanding, the world is transformed. The world is saved. The world becomes the kingdom of Almighty God. When we are available, present, when we show up, we can speak the word and change the world for all eternity. It is not simply to get more butts in the pews so that we can fill out the conference material. For heaven's sake, that's not that important. It is simply not that. It is to get more hearts into the heart of Jesus Christ every day. Dr. Tom Long, who is the former Brandy, Bandy Chair of Preaching at Candler School of Theology, has penned in his book, Whispering the Lyrics, shares a story that Robert Withrow told about a man named Jack Casey. Jack worked as a member of an ambulance rescue squad. But when Jack was a little child, he had oral surgery and they had to pull five teeth at one time. He was a terrified little guy. What he remembered most, though, was that the operating room nurse who recognized his terror said to him, Don't worry, I'll be right here beside you no matter what happens. And when Jack woke up from that surgery, she had kept her word and was standing right there next to him. He never forgot. Twenty years later, in fact, Jack's ambulance team is called out to an accident. A truck is overturned. The driver's pinned in the cab, and they're using power tools to cut him out of the cab. But gasoline is leaking everywhere, and the driver is terrified it's going to catch fire and incinerate him. This is a true scene from 911, I think. So Jack crawls into the cab with this driver and says to him, Look, don't worry, I'm right here with you. I'm not going anywhere. And Jack stayed with the man until they removed him from the wreckage. Later, the truck driver told Jack, Are you a freaking idiot? Do you know that whole thing could have exploded and we both could have been burnt to a crisp? And Jack told him he just couldn't leave him. A vow is a promise not to be taken so lightly. Take this most seriously, my friends. A yes on earth is a yes in heaven and a no on earth is a no in heaven. What you say to one another now is eternal. I mean, when we take the vows of church membership, it doesn't simply give us a place that we can have our wedding or our funeral. It is a gift and a vow to Almighty God. Yes, we will support the community of faith with our prayers, not just our casual Christmas list. And yes, we will support the community with our presence. We will show up. Not sometimes, not just on Christmas, Easter, and Mother's Day, making us a wonderful CME Christian. I wonder what that says about fathers, by the way. But that's another sermon. No, it's a vow. A vow to be available and to be present. To be there with others who are struggling on their spiritual journey. To find their way to the Father. To have one and one relationships with Jesus Christ. To hear and to listen and follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit thanks to our faithful presence. It's being available to those who have heartache, 
broken lives and shattered dreams. It's being present to support the whole body of Christ so that we can be stronger together rather than trying to make it alone. It's honoring those baptismal vows that we recite every time there is a baptism at this altar that we will so order our lives after the example of Christ that we will be available to raise this child together. These are holy and sacred vows that no longer can be taken flippantly. Not in this season, not in this day, not in this church. In 1739... Brother John Wesley wrote, directly opposite to this is the gospel of Christ. Solitary religion is not to be found there. Holy solitaries is a phrase no no more consistent with the gospel than holy adulterers. The gospel of Christ knows of no religion but social. No holiness but social holiness. Together and showing up. The second practice of membership vows is the commitment to be present. The priority of presence is expressed through corporate worship and in small group community. Mr. Wesley again says no one walks the path of discipleship alone. There's no such thing as a solitary Christian. Oh, what about spiritual hermits who hide out in caves and write these great dissertations? Well, They're actually not alone, my friends. They have the community of saints all around them. Some hermits claim that they're not there but for a short time. John Wesley explicitly rejects going it alone. Holy solitaries. He's insistent on the importance of community for becoming Christ-like. There is no such thing as a self-made individual Christian. Archbishop Desmond Tutu wrote that, excuse me, often taught about the African concept of Ubuntu, which means my humanity is inextricably bound up in your humanity. A person is a person through other persons. And finally, Dr. Jim Harnish wrote that the Methodist missionary E. Stanley Jones once said that everyone who belongs to Christ belongs to everyone who belongs to Christ. We are in this journey together. And we cannot go it alone. We need the whole community, the full village, the body, the family, the church, all the time. Corporate worship is the best expression of that. For it is your commitment to be present in worship doesn't just happen by showing up on a Sunday morning. So no, I'm not preaching just to the choir. I'm preaching to those who are faithfully here and reminding us that the work of worship is more than just showing up. It is being present in the full fourfold liturgy, the work of the people. It's one, gathering with the community. It is two, hearing the word for the community and for you. It is three, responding to the word in action and in change. It is four, then going forth into the world to serve and to witness. Small group community is the place where the rubber hits the road, where the real task of, as Paul says, working out your salvation happens. Yes, it's a continual process of lifelong journey that it works that needs the support of others. Real congregational care and real congregational growth happens in discipleship groups where there is care and accountability. Small groups can range from Sunday school, Bible studies, covenant groups, affinity groups, social fellowship groups, to service and mission teams. So what are you saying, preacher, that I have to be here every time the door is open in my assigned pew or out God is going to get me? Not at all. I might get you, but God is not going to get you. God understands that there are times that the body will be missing various parts for various reasons. And these find out that other parts step up and fill in the gap for just a little bit of the time. But it is the heart that matters. It is the heart. Do you miss when you aren't here being with the body of Christ? If you sense you're missing something by being away, if your week feels a bit less because you didn't make it to church online or in person this Sunday, 
It's not guilt nagging at you. It is God filling your heart with good, with need, with hope, with love. Be glad and celebrate for you understand the meaning and the power of critical mass. Of how much your presence affects those who are here and how much it affects you week after week on your journey. It is not to produce guilt, but powerful faith. Not to produce fear, but overwhelming joy. Not to bring you to shame, but to a longing to come and to change the world for Jesus Christ in the fellowship of the body of Christ, His church. Never forsake the assembling of yourselves together, says Paul. Be here when you possibly can. Make it a priority like you do a good education, like you do your health, like you do family loyalty, and watch and see what God Almighty can do in a church like Kingswood Church, a united Methodist community. Watch and see what Dunwoody, Georgia will experience from this very epic center when you are faithful with your presence. We will be faithful to the United Methodist Church with our prayers, our presence. But will we? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.